Hello, and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the Promised Land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I'm your host, Brian Broom, joined today by Greg Uttinger. Today we'll be talking about the divided kingdom of Israel, and man, it's just a mess. That's the best way to describe it. Uh, there's there's not a lot of winners on, on either side for uh, a good stretch of time. But uh, Greg, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Well, we saw Solomon's fall into partial apostasy. Now, given that he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, at some point, he looked back and realized that was dumb. But the, the, the historical books don't give us any hint of, of that. They just take us to, well, he married all these wives, total of a thousand of them, and made room for their gods on the Mount of Olives in the end and practiced polygamy uh, outwardly, if not with his heart. And um, God, having warned him about this in two previous visions, uh, said, well, that's that. We're done now. Uh, I'm pulling the plug, as it were. And here are the words as Chronicles gives them to us. Uh, this is what he he had warned. If you go after other gods, then I will pluck them up by the roots out of my land that is Israel, which I've given them. And this house, which I've sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all nations. And this house, which is high, the temple that is, shall be an astonishment to everyone that passeth by it, so that he shall say, what? Why hath the Lord done thus unto this land and to this house? And things before Solomon's even dead, things begin to play out. God, through his prophet, Ahijah, approaches uh, Jeroboam, a young man who is the foreman of all of Solomon's building projects. And one assumes that someone in, in privacy uh, grabs him, tears the cloak off his back and tears it to 10 pieces and or 12 pieces and gives him 10 of them and says, basically, I'm giving you 10 of the tribes because of Solomon's apostasy is idolatry and unbelief. And um, yeah, and if you follow me, I'll establish your house. Um, but I'm, I'm keeping two tribes to David for the sake of my promise to him. Now, that having happened, one assumes in private, it's amazing how it got around. It sounds like Jeroboam probably... Um, told his friends, who told their friends. Who, Anyway, in time, Solomon found out and chased him off, and he ran down to Egypt, where he was until Solomon's death. When Solomon's son Rehoboam is ready to come to the throne, Israel calls Jeroboam back. Jeroboam gladly comes, and the ten northern tribes submit uh, an ultimatum to Solomon's son Rehoboam, which amounts to, your father taxes too much, worked us too hard, and was just way too bossy all the way around. Lighten up on us, and you can be our king. Interestingly enough, Israel called Rehoboam to them into the tribe of Ephraim, rather than Jerusalem, which is in Judah, uh, to Shechem, to a city which has lo a long history going back to Jacob. And throughout Jeroboam, we'll see this next time as we look at the whole golden calf thing, uh, there was a lot of play on well, we've been God's people for a long time, all the way back to Jacob, and we have Israel, the northern tribes, we have claims, and we have monuments, and we have important sites, and we have traditions, and what's this thing about Judah and Jerusalem being all that important? God has lots of peoples, and there is a lot of, I mean, uh, patriarchal tradition going on here. So uh, anyway, they basically tell Rehoboam, cool it, or we're out of here. Uh, Rehoboam talks to the old men who stood before Solomon, and they say, be nice to them, and this will go well. He deserts that and goes to the young men and says, what shall we say to them? So he appeals to younger men, younger being about 40. That's about how old he was. And they say, no, no, be tough with them. Just smack them down. Tell them they're not getting away with anything. You're going to be so much tougher than your dad and all that. And that's what he does in the 10 tribes leave. And thus create one of the most difficult problems for Bible teachers, Sunday school teachers and such, in all of Scripture, in that now we're going to have two nations, one called Israel and one called Judah, with two lines of kings, and no one can keep them straight, it seems. Oh, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I had the advantage when I was in, uh, in elementary school that uh, my teacher, who's also my pastor, in, a, in an effort, I think, to avoid doctrinal controversy, took us through the Old Testament histories over and over in detail. So I learned the history of Samuel and Kings backwards and forwards over and over again. 
But when I try to help um, Bible teachers, Sunday school teachers understand it, it, it just seems that everyone scratches their head and says, I just can't keep them straight. You know, maybe you have to work on it. But what happens in a nutshell here is the kingdom is divided roughly north and south. It's not a straight line, but it's more or less that. The northern tribes are called the ten tribes, although the number count is a little artificial, because the tribe of Simeon had its possessions within the borders of Judah. So it really didn't go anywhere. Uh, the descendants of David have Judah, the, the royal tribe. They also have Benjamin, because which was Saul's tribe, and they've won them over, and they're, they're loyal. They also have a good many Levites, and a lot of Levites eventually moved down into Judah and Jerusalem when Jeroboam pulls the whole golden calf thing. But then so do a lot of other faithful people from the north. So it's it's not a hard and fast separation by any means. But for our purposes, let's just say there are 10 northern tribes and they call themselves Israel. Um, the southern tribes are Judah, Benjamin, and a host of others, individuals, and they call themselves Judah. Judah contains Jerusalem, Solomon's temple, and it is ruled over in almost unbroken succession by the sons of David. There is an interruption briefly later on that we'll talk about it some, actually in quite a, quite a bit in length of, eventually. Um, the Northern Kings are ruled over by one dynasty after another, starting <laughs> with this Jeroboam guy. Uh, he sets up golden calves as a rival to the Jerusalem temple and claims it's the old time religion, appealing back to the golden calf in Moses' day. These are your gods that brought you up by the land of, Israel, of Egypt. Uh, because it's, are, it's also an odd claim to make. It it's sort of like <laughs> when it's like the illiteracy when there's like the you know verse a day calendar for motivation and it's just like <laughs> you are the man <laughs> or bow down and worship me and all these things I will give unto you. <laughs> it's like you, you you're Judas, missing the context yeah. around this thing. <laughs> Judas went out and hung himself. Go thou and do likewise. What you do do quickly. Um, yeah, in that, in, in that sense, tangent, um, my girls were once more expressing their sorrow that we wouldn't let them use. We are the world as their recessional for high school. And I just really, I think I mentioned this before. I recently realized, wait, there's this verse in there about as God has showed us by changing stones to bread. I don't know how many times I, I heard that without registering. Wait, that's Satan talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are oh, not no. gonna we're not going to put that in God's mouth. And what, a Christian, what song is this? I, we, I don't need We are the world. We are the children. A oh, bunch dear. of a bunch of Holly or not Hollywood, well, yeah, basically. A bunch of um rock stars got together to produce uh a video and a song. To raise money. Oh, for yes, I remember Africa. this. Okay, this was yeah. uh, years and Ma years ago. Yeah, led by Michael Jackson. And got I, I, I got no problem with the music. And the, the, I'm, I'm glad to see them spend their money on uh, children in Africa. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But that one line, the, yeah, God God changed stones to bread. No, he didn't. <laughs> Don't Let's not confuse people. Yeah, so context is, is, is key. And the whole golden calf thing is... Yeah, we'll talk more about that next time. Anyhow, so the Northern Kingdom goes through a series of dynasties, each one basically initiated by some kind of bloody coup, revelation, revolution, or something, because God had said in the law that idolaters survived to the third and fourth generation, and then he overthrows them, and that's the history of the Northern Kingdom is good evidence of that. Uh, but God, and, and this is part of the point for tonight, Despite what God had said is when this happens, when you when you worship idols, I'm going to move you out of my sight and destroy this temple. God lets the northern kingdom go on for a couple hundred years. And they have their, their downs, and they have their bad kings, and they have their blood purges, and their revolutions, and their coups. And yet right at the end, another king named Jeroboam, why someone else named their, king Jerob their son Jeroboam and made him king is a good question, but they did, Jeroboam II. He becomes the, the most successful ruler of the Northern Kingdom, expands Israel's borders to basically what they were in the time of David. Uh, tremendous economic success, at peace with their neighbors, even has Judah under their thumb. This is, and, and Jonah gets to prophesy all this and says, and you're going to get all this and you don't even have to repent. Then came the whole big fish thing. But um, 
you know, and then suddenly after Jeroboam the second dies, it all spirals into destruction real fast. But it, and here's the point for tonight. It took a long, long time. What was with God here? I mean, God said, you do this, I'm going to smack you. No smackage came. It just seemed to go on and on and on. Judah was did a little better, but not a lot. They maintained the temple, kind of. Some of the kings treated it very badly. God did grant them two great revivals toward the end, or at least outward reforms. Hezekiah and Josiah both led. We, see, we generally say revivals, but it looks more like for a good part of it, it was outward reform powered by the kings, because as soon as the kings died, the people went right back to idolatry. But Judah outlasted Israel by 150 years or so. I don't have the dates down in front of me. And then finally, 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 the Chaldeans under Nebuchadnezzar came and did not destroy Jerusalem right away. In fact, he, he invested it, I think, three times before he finally said, okay, we're done now. Uh, and by that time, Daniel was his right-hand man. And he just... <laughs> sorry, well, it, sorry. It's the same... God wants it destroyed. <laughs> Well, it's the same kind of pattern that we see God display towards the people who, well, at least in this ep epoch of history, are in the line of Messiah, which is, you know, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Yeah. Th technically, that has been fulfilled because the curse was released and the Messiah needed to come. That, that temporally speaking, that order happened, but they didn't die that day. Right. And he let them continue existing. <laughs> um, the warning of the flood. I'm going to destroy it all. They have 120 years. What? That's a good long time. <laughs> yeah. Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. It's going to be 400 years from now. Or, and yeah, here's what we're getting at. God's times are not our times. God's not in a hurry. His mercy, we, we, we can say truly his mercy is infinite, but even within our temporal situation, it, he is long-suffering. And we look and say, well, where are the judgments of God? One, thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. <laughs> <laughs> but God himself says, woe to you that desire the day of the Lord. It's darkness, not light, even very dark, and there's no light, and there's no light in it. And the application to, to our age and time, and th this is a personal testimony, and then I, I know you have some things to say with regard to uh, Psalm 89. But as I was growing up, I grew up, in a very conservative home, where conspiracy theory was the gospel in some in some respects, quite literally. And I was told over and over again that the United States was on a short leash. It was going down, if not by subversion from the inside, then by pressure from the outside. The Soviet Union was at some point just going to take over, whether it was just by threatening or whether it was by launching a first strike and knocking out our missiles so we had we had no response, or um, whatever, they, the conspirators, the insiders, uh, had everything in their hand. And although we could try desperately and maybe, maybe possibly by some remote chance, something could happen. And yes, you could pray. Of course you should pray, but really, you know, it's all over. Uh. This is, this is what I grew up with. And it is very depressing. My mother lived in the shadow of this. And, and anytime it kind of resurfaced, she, she would become very depressed and, and afraid. Um, yeah. And I dealt with that some. And you know what? America, after a fashion, is still here. Is it the America I grew up with? No, not exactly. And yet, I still have most of the freedoms I had as a kid. I can come and go. I can buy things at the store. There's more to buy. Technology has advanced. Healthcare has advanced. If I get sick, I can go to the doctor and actually two better doctors than I had. Uh, I've had three wonderful daughters, and they're growing up with a sense of hope. So... I have a church. I can go freely, except for that little thing a couple of years ago where everything shut down. That was a little scary. It, what I was told didn't happen. And although on the one hand, it came out of a right-wing conservative perspective, you heard the same thing in right-wing fundamentalism. You know, Jesus is coming back. The, 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 the end is at hand. My generation... A lot of people firmly believe that Jesus was coming back by 1981. The reasoning was this. Uh, Israel was reborn as a nation in 1948. Matthew's uh, Olivet Discourse, Jesus says something about a budding fig tree and this generation will not pass away. It's not what that means, but that's how it was interpreted. 
So from the time Israel was reborn, generations about 40 years, 48 plus 40 is 88, seven years backward for the Great Tribulation, 1981. And if you didn't, some people would just say, well, you know, in there someplace. Others were pretty specific if you didn't believe it. I mean, this was what the Bible said. You were a liberal. Uh-huh. You did not believe the word of God. And we weren't going to be around much longer. How Lindsay, what your planet Earth, we should be living like people who don't plan on being around much longer. Judgment so, was coming. The last days were inevitable. Yeah. It didn't happen. <laughs> it's, al- it's always interesting to me when you get accused of being a liberal for holding to a you know, <laughs> eschatological framework that is uh, older than <laughs> the supposed conservatives. But <laughs> yeah. And it involves a sounder hermeneutic. No, I actually have read the text. Have you? That's not say what you think it means. Today, as a, as a teacher in a Christian school, we have a lot of kids in our school whose parents immigrated from uh, Russia or the conquered the satellite countries a generation or two back. So they're still, they're still very rooted in that Slavic culture. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, the first thing, the first assertion was, this is the beginning of World War III. Follow the logic. This is the beginning of World War III, obviously. Because it's all about it's all about our people, so it has to be the center of history. Two, being since this is the beginning of World War Three, that means this leads to Armageddon because World War Three leads to Armageddon because we've been told this for a very very long time. So Jesus is coming back in our lifetime real soon. Uh, let's see, <laughs> all of these points are wrong, and yet these are and this is what these young people are growing up with, and it's a little scary. And it's without contradicting their parents and their churches, it's kind of hard to say, you know, there are other ways you could look at this. But we we are disposed in our unbelief, in our inability to trust God, to say things have now got as bad as they are. At least we're at the breaking point. And from here, everything goes downhill. This is the line. Somewhere in here, we've crossed a line from which there is no return. This is something that keeps happening over and over again. And at this point in Israel... Think about Rome. Yeah. Oh, If you think about the the fall of Rome, people were like, this is the end. Every The history is over. There is nothing else that could possibly... It's all downhill and Jesus is coming back. And look, we're roughly 1,500 years on (laughs) from that. You know, Rome's interesting because as a history teacher... Um, as a, first of all, as a history student, I was taught, matter of factly, Rome fell in 476. And so every now and then, as a history teacher, I would run across an earlier date, 410 or something, I forget. And I thought, huh. What's that? What's that going on there? Eventually, I found out that was the first time Rome was sacked. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it, <laughs> then there was a time it was almost sacked, but the, the, I think it was the Vikings missed and got the wrong city, and were, nobody bothered to tell them, or they were ashamed to admit it. But, you know... <laughs> But not too well, it's been a few years now. I ran into an article that said this fall of Rome thing is a big conspiracy. There's conspiracy again. Rome never it, fell. Look, oh. it's still there. <laughs> this is all a Germanic conspiracy to sidetrack Rome, sidelight it, and to put the emphasis upon Charlemagne's kingdom and the Holy Roman Empire that grew out of that and all of Northern Europe. But look, Rome's there. On the other hand, Who you could say. Who puts an emphasis on the Holy Roman Empire? <laughs> <laughs> like everyone goes, it's none of those things. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the Eastern Empire, w- w- whose capital was Constantinople, or as people choose to call it, Byzantium. And they actually called it Constantinople because that was its name. Byzantium was its former Greek name. And there's a little bit of historical conspiracy there going on but it enjoyed, but it has a different name now but that's nobody's business but the but turks. the turks yes i know um it endured for a thousand years and then if you read good dispensational writers on the book of daniel the true successor of pagan rome is papal rome and when you look at the beast the fourth beast of daniel that little horn that stands up that's the pope so that's the true rome never fell because it's reincarnated in the papacy like, okay, can we not do that? Um, <laughs> uh, oh, dear. We, we, we are too quick to look for the horrors of destruction and failure and quick, too quick to draw lines. There's Which a, I think uh, I'll let you go. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say there's a, there's a line that – there's a couple lines that have hung with me from books. They're completely irrelevant lines, but they were relevant here. Isaac Asimov and Foundation – uh, his science fiction novel set in the far distant future uh, 
has a character say somewhere in the 50 years just past is where the historians of the future will place an arbitrary line and say this marks the fall of the galactic empire and the, the point is <laughs> the fall of anything takes decades or centuries or even millennia and any line is arbitrary uh, when did the reformation actually begin did, did trumpet sound <laughs> the day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses, a document which acknowledged the existence of purgatory and the authority and goodwill of the Pope. Um, you know, there's other things you could pick that were a little more thorough, and yet that we've, we've latched onto that one. And um, you can also point even earlier back to Huss. To Huss or Wycliffe. several other pre, pre-Luther, yeah. pre-Luther, <laughs> yeah. um, reformers. Yeah. Going back 300 years. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to mark off eras unless they are I – mean, with a war, you can say opening shots and peace treaty, you at least kind of narrow it down. But even that – Yeah, that, lot, that's practicality. That's practicality. A lot of people are, are fond of saying that World War II is just the extension of World War I with some breathing room in between. The, the uh, history teacher who does Crash Course, Crash Course in World History, John Green, yeah, has ha, has a uh, 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 what you call it? It's not. I don't think you call it a podcast, but a program, whatever it is, um, about the Renaissance. And his the title is "Was the Renaissance a Thing?" <laughs> and he actually does a great. That's right. I've I've seen some clips from that. It's very interesting. It is. It's very interesting. He's a great teacher. As far as I know, he's not a Christian, but he he tries to to maintain balance. He's he's very humorous. He moves very fast. But he, one of the signs is. Did 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 some father walk out one day and say, "Give on, you give on, you come out here. Do you smell that? Do you hear that? The Renaissance has just dawned. You stand at the beginning of an era." No, nobody did that. Most people just went on with their lives. They didn't know there was such a thing as a Renaissance. Um, he, he, in the long run, concludes that strictly speaking, it wasn't a thing. But the, the, there were things that happened, more or less parallel or as cause and effect, that we can take note of. But God did not write. In flaming letters across the sky, today the Renaissance begins any more than he wrote. Now the Reformation is is has begun. It's, uh, it's also, you know, even even today with our very fast modes of communication, mm-hmm. the same kind of societal changes or movements or whatever they don't take place in the same locations at the same time. Right. So you can't say the Reformation was from fifteen seventeen to. 1601 yeah. everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and even saying, well, we it started in one country and at that date ended in another country and other stuff happened in Disney. Uh, we do that because to learn, we have to draw arbitrary line circles, boundaries, whatever. But it is wisdom to acknowledge these are arbitrary. They're our labels, not God's. Yep. They leave a lot to the imagination and a lot of wiggle room and sometimes they're just flat out wrong. Um, <laughs> well, and, the Dark Ages, for one. Yeah, the Dark Ages. There's a good one. The Dark Ages, which at one point encompassed the whole Middle Ages. And then, of course, the Middle Ages. Where, is, where did they be? The fall of Rome, the conversion of Constantine. Where exactly to the beginning of the Renaissance, <laughs> whatever that was? Um, to Dante, to, um, to the fall of Constantinople. That's what I was taught, as an, again, as an arbitrary marker. But then the Dark Ages, as modern scholarship began a little less prejudicially to look at them, said, well, wait, these later years weren't so dark. Let's let's move that back. Oh, let's but this had had this happened here, these inventions. Let's push it back. And so finally, today, even secular scholars pretty much acknowledge that the Dark Ages, such as they were, were a rather limited time after um the Roman Senate packed up and said, We're done here, and the barbarian kings are welcome to rule. Um, there was there was a little bit of time when Roman bureaucracy was not doing its thing, and before other entities picked up their jobs. Okay, we'll call that the Dark Ages, but it was it was brief. It's less ages and more like the Dark Years. Yeah. It's like <laughs> it's a period of Pink Floyd albums. You know, yeah. it's not. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so and then the title Middle Ages, middle between what? Well, in their mind. It was in between the classic golden age of Greece and Rome and the new age of the Renaissance or later of the Enlightenment. Talk about a prejudicial, uh, completely biased uh, way of drawing timelines and of labeling things. Well, so I'm, I'm sure you may have seen that um, 
that chart where it's like I'll have to I'll have to send it to you. You can see the visual, but um, it's essentially like cultural sophistication over time, and it's like uh, Greece and Rome. They're like up here above the graph, and then it's you know spiking up to Rome, and then it's like oh the fall of Rome. Everything goes down. It's the Christian Dark Ages, <laughs> and it, like it just flat, just like an inch above the ground yeah. for like. A thousand years and then yeah. suddenly goes up and it's like, oh, the Renaissance. Oh, and now look at us. We could have been here because of this gap now and it's yeah. all religion's fault. It's like incredibly biased and just non-factual. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there have been a lot of books written in the last 10 years or so from from all sorts of directions, uh, from Protestant historians, but also from Roman Catholics who don't appreciate being told their religion destroyed the world. Um, to to secularists who are really just saying, wait, I think we've been a little biased here. Uh, let's look at the facts for a minute. Mm -hmm. Who are saying it was that's not what really happened. And um, we we were talking before we started recording about how someone might analyze the death of the United States. I ran into an article a few years back by, I'm sure, a nice lady, uh, Dr. Elena Johnson Pugh. It's anti-Marxist. But upon Obama's reelection, she said, the United States have reached the point of no return. The United States of America is now relegated to the dustbin of history as a has been empire. All she saw ahead was endless years of darkness, dictatorship, and serfdom. Well, so far she's wrong. And I, I, your response was, do you remember? Yeah, why, why draw the line at 2008 when you could draw the line at like any other period <laughs> in American history? FDR's election uh Woodrow Wilson and the the first world war um the civil heck, war if you want like a, a spicy take you could say uh Nixon's removing of currency from the gold standard even yeah Lincoln suspending habeas corpus during yeah. the civil war for instance and you want to get really radical how about the creation of the constitution that contains no explicit acknowledgement of Christ in his reign over the nations and in fact forbids asking any questions about such of any political candidate no test, um, no t no religious tests allowed, and an oath sworn to no god in particular. So there, there are people, uh, the Covenanters come to mind, who say, "Yeah, that's that's right out. That's not Jesus is Lord of the nations. If you haven't covenanted in His name, then this is not a Christian nation." And they didn't support the Constitution. So this, this, and, and what this is coming back to, uh, first of all, and I would like you to talk about Psalm eighty nine here in just a second, is God's doesn't do things the way we think he ought to. Mm -hmm. He's on a different timeline. His mercies are infinite and his plans are devious. And uh, <laughs> here we're, here we're, I, I, I've said many, many, many times, got sneaky. Um, devious may be my, my new word now, but what that means is God's smarter than we are. And he doesn't, our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. He's clever. He's clever. Yeah. I mean, infinite wisdom, but I, I, I like those other words in that they suggest that he's deliberately not doing things the way we want. Now, is that because he's laughing at us or is that because we are just so foolish that we can't see in a straight line or at least his straight line? Probably a little bit of both, you know? <laughs> yeah. So in the days of, um, of the, when the kingdom was divided, a lot of people could say, well, that's it. It's all going to fall to pieces. And Egypt did invade the southern kingdom of Judah shortly, and yet it all endured. At some point, the psalmist in Psalm 89 um, and I'm not sure exactly when that said it, it was at some time when Judah was undergoing uh, extreme distress. The psalmist cries out, well, why don't you tell us about Psalm 89? You, you just read it in your family devotions. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a it's a wonderful, wonderful psalm. Uh, the way that the um, reading plan that we're following split it up, it split it right down the middle uh, across mm -hmm. two different days. The first half is all praises to God. It's mm -hmm. Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord, like unto thee, the heavens are thine. I'm skipping around. This is not in order. Yeah. The North and the South, thou hast created them. Uh, a mighty arm, strong as thy hand and high as thy right hand. The Lord is our defense and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Uh, thou spakest in a vision to thy Holy One and saidst, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. Uh, and then in the second half, um, it continues talking about the seed of David and 
it talks about even the the punishments in verse um in verse 30 it says if my if his children david's children forsake my law and not and walk not in my judgments if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments then will i visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes and continues on and says, I will not utterly take from him my loving kindness or suffer my faithfulness to fail. But even as he says this, he, the, the psalmist says, thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant. Thou hast profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. Thou hast broken down all his hedges. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin. All that pass by the way spoil him. He is a reproach to his neighbors. Skipping forward, the days of his youth hast thou shortened. Thou hast covered him with shame. Selah. How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? And right there at the end, it's it's destruction, destruction, destruction. And the very last line, the very last glimmer of hope, as so many psalms end with this sudden doxology of praise says, blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. After he just seemed to have said, you're faithful and you've ruined it all. You've (laughs) ruined everything and brought it down to the ground because of our sin. If any period of time, this Psalm 89, whatever period in Israel's history, this was written around, that would seem to be the time you draw the line and say, ah, it's all downhill yeah, from here. Yeah. There's no more hope for Israel. But the thing is, is that, like you're saying, decline takes time. But we also have the promise. And that's the promise that God is going to keep David's house forever. Yeah. Ultimately, leading to Jesus, the Messiah whose throne lasts forever. And since he has eternal life within him, it is lasting forever. We're brought into that. We're brought into the kingdom of of light from the kingdom of darkness. But looking at it externally is the same kind of problem that the Pharisees in the time of Jesus's earthly ministry fell into. They, They looked at the exterior and they said, well, you know, this Jesus guy, we don't like him. He he makes fun of us. We're the ones with authority, not him. Mm-hmm. And also, he's not a conquering king. He's not setting yeah. up Jerusalem as the capital of an earthly nation that is going to, you know, throw off the shackles of Caesar. It's all external to them. They they have no I I guess what's the word I'm looking for? Not a paradigm, but uh something else. You know, they don't have a, a category for the underlying spiritual reality that no. Jesus's earthly ministry and ultimately his his death and resurrection represent we shortchange god by assuming that he's going to do things the way that we think he's going to do them mhm and part of that is drawing the line and saying it's over the church has failed mm. um i mean that was dispensationalism and when when John Darby in England, a member of the Plymouth Brethren, looked at the established church of his day, he looked and said, it's dead, it's sterile, nothing's coming out of this. Well, there's a great deal of truth in that. And said, therefore, the church age has failed. Well, that's a huge generalization. Um, About that. <laughs> and therefore, his conclusion was God, God obviously never intended for it to succeed. Uh, the, all the prophecies about about the success of God's kingdom are in terms of power and glory and the returning king and uh, and armies and angels and and signs in the, uh, heaven and they're all wrapped up with Israel and all these external things. That has to be the main thing. The church was just a a side affair that God had for a little bit, and now He's going to go back, and that means this church needs to leave. And Somewhere in there, somebody, and you can read the various church histories to try to decide who it was, came up with this idea of the church leaving before, well before, the visible second coming. To that point in history, they had been more or less simultaneous events. Jesus would return visibly, take his church to himself, and then within a short matter of time, judge the world. With this idea that there would actually be years between them during which the Great Tribulation and a great many prophecies came, that was brand new, but it it started with this, the church has failed. Um, and there's nothing we can do, and we've tried. In fact, so the first step, the first step actually was to disassociate from the established church 
and and focus on on little Christian cell groups and such and uh, personal what we today would call small groups, not within the church but to the detriment of the church. We've abandoned the church. Church is gone, and we who remain are the last remnant. And and we still have that. That this this Jesus said, "I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against." And we say, "Yeah, but he didn't mean it." <laughs> I was going to say, like, <laughs> that's that's the primary method of discipleship in yeah. a lot of broader evangelicalism. It's like you come to church for the, the happy feelings of worship music uh-huh. and, a, and a good feel good sermon, which is actually just all law wrapped up in a in a bow. It's a broken on fire bow. But um, <laughs> and then you go and you hook up in a small group and that's where you actually learn about the Bible. Yeah, it's with it's with the small group. There's nothing. The pastor is just an entertainment factor. Yeah, to to draw the crowd. And when we and I, I appreciate that you said law because that, of course, is exactly what it is. But if you told them that, oh, they'd be horrified. No, no, there's no law here. We don't preach God's law at all, and they would be correct. <laughs> it's not God's wow. law they're preaching. <laughs> their own traditions, their own ten easy steps to doing this or that. They they have we don't lists have of traditions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're not old enough to even be traditions yet. But you know these things that we do that you do will make you happy, healthy, wise, and all that, and get God's blessings. But holding up Jesus and calling you to repent of your sins and receive His blood bought salvation. That's offensive. So we'll channel you into small groups, and eventually some, we're sure somebody will tell you about the gospel sooner or later. And this is not to disparage small groups. We have a we have a Bible study that meets on Wednesday night, and it's more or less a lot of the same people. We come and go, and people, you know, kind of rotate oh, in yeah. and out. But that's not church. That's something additional. That's something that we do because we want to spend time together and because we love the Word of God and we we'll talk about it. Uh, but church is something else. Church is God ordained. It's sacramental, and it is the place God has established the preaching of the gospel to not only to call people to faith, but to create faith in them by preaching and by the work of the Spirit. And it's a kind of thing that does not happen in place else. So this, uh, it is of this, not of small groups, that God says, "Where two or three are gathered in My name, there am I in the midst of." Them. We completely misread that. The original context was as communicating somebody. That's the official act. The two or three are the are the two or three apostles, two or three church elders executing God's sentence on sin. God's there. Now again, go to your small group. Good. Learn the Bible. Excellent. Wonderful. But don't let that take the place of the church. It can't and it won't. Church yeah. is the place that God has promised to yes. work. He may work other ways. He may. Yes. He may work through a small group that, you know, somebody happens to be invited to and they're converted by God's grace, but that's not the place that God has promised to show up. Right. The promise. Jesus stands and knocks at the door of the church because in that case, Laodicea, the church had pushed him outside. But he came not to their small groups. He came to the church and knocked on the door. So this, this is something, of course, we keep coming back to again and again. If depravity is indeed total, if there is absolutely nothing man can do to himself, then trying to minister to man's flesh, to his Adamic nature, to try to give him some button he can push, some ring he can pull, some act of service he can do to start the process is a waste of time and an insult to God. It is the preaching of the law. It is contrary to the gospel. It is Antichrist. However well-intentioned. If, if man is totally depraved, then only God can save him, and the only ordinances God will use are those that God has promised to use, either by extension or directly. So yep. the one, as you say, the one place he's promised to be is the church. Now, by extension, he may work through individuals, Bible reading, Christian radio. He may. Evangelism. He may not. Evangelism, absolutely. He promises that. But that's the work of the church, and that's why in the passage we know, Romans 10, you know, we know the faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But then he asks, well, how shall they hear, how shall they call upon him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear of him if no one preaches? And how shall they preach except they be sent? In Paul's mind, preaching is an official act of the church, whereby the church sends out men to evangelize, to be missionaries, 
And yes, they may have lots of support and helpers and wives and children and all kinds of other people and technologies of various sorts, but the church authorizes, ordains them to go do this. And, and of course, and again, in addition, the individual worship, a, a witness of private Christians, yes, keep doing that, please. But in the process, don't despise the church our mother because it's, she's the bride of Christ. And we do that at our peril. And so let us not say the church has failed. Let us rather reckon with God's incredible wisdom and his sneakiness. How, you know, look at the American church. How is God going to fix this? I have no idea. But he knows exactly what he's doing. And it's going to be fun in a couple thousand years to meet in heaven and say, so what happened? Okay, all you people who've come from, who've come from earth who've died and come to heaven in the last hundred years or so, what happened? What happened to this United States of America? Yeah, there used to be a nation called that. Ah! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now it's called the kingdom of God. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, what or whatever, however God's going to do it. Our imaginations are too small. It's, it's stupid even to speculate. And yeah, I, I, there's one other thing I want to say just in passing, but any, any thoughts, uh, any other thoughts along these lines? I just think reaffirming the fact that the United States is not the subject of Bible prophecy. Well, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, you know, we are, we are a nation and we, we happen to be the top nation, uh, as a uh, seller and Yates would, would capitalize it. <laughs> um, but there's been lots of top nations before us. There will likely be many more after us. It is, it is the greatest foolishness to tie your eschatology to your nationality. Yes. Or to anyone's nationality. Yes. Whether it be United States or Israel or Russia. Um, or Germany. Or Germany. About 90 years ago. Yeah. Well, I don't know how many people who are listening have ever heard of Robert Nitz, but he was a conservative sociologist back in the, the 50s, 60s, I guess, 70s. Uh, his book, The Idea of progress is worth everybody's time because he goes back and looks historically at this thing we call, well, not even progress, the the very idea of progress. We living in America assume, well, progress is a thing. Progress happens. But you know, for the classical age, no one believed that, really. They, they didn't. Everything just, all things continue as they are for the beginning of creation. Um, if there was a creation from their point of view, nothing really, really changed. They had a cyclical view or a static view of history. And it was Augustine that first really introduced this idea of a linear history that was going someplace. And once you open the possibility of history going someplace, you have to ask the question, where's it going? Um, and the Middle Ages was, Christendom was able to stop and say, well, I guess it could get better. Took the Reformation to say, well, in terms of worship and preaching, it can get a lot better, we're, and we're going to do that right now. But then that opened the door to, so could it get better in other ways? Could technology improve? Could moral character improve? Could political conditions improve? Could economic conditions improve? And that whole possibility of change became a thing that sociologists could now get a job studying because it was a thing now. But uh, Nisbet, in talking about it, he, one of his quotes, and I'm not sure where it comes from, I just have the quote itself. He says, sociologists ask, ought to ask, what is the nature of change and what's so natural about it? But he, in an article called The Year 2000 and All That, uh, argued that historical prediction based on statistics, cycles, and current trends is impossible. He says, because historians always have to, and sociologists always have to reckon with uh, four things. The random event, the maniac, the prophet, and the genius. These are not, and, and every evolutionist in the end has to admit, well, first of all, random event. What is evolution but a series of random events? And random means random. You cannot predict this thing is going to happen. As for these other things, the maniac, I suppose you could think of someone like Adolf Hitler here, or other people we could, the prophet, anyone from uh, Muhammad to Gandhi, the genius, Newton to Einstein. Think of how these individuals change the course of history. You can look at history just before them and say, well, I see where this is going. Straight line to, oops, what do you mean you invented physics and calculus in the space <laughs> of a lifetime? 
Um, yeah. Um, you overthrew all of standard physics in just a few years and gave us the atomic bomb indirectly. Yeah, I think maybe that, that affected history a little bit. Or well, Slightly. Yeah. yeah. You, you had conversations with Gabriel. He gave you a book called The Quran. Oh, surely that could have no substantial effects anytime, anyplace. Or I'm sure they were all burned out by 732 when we chased you guys out of Europe. Yeah. Um, About that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, to this, uh, Nisbet writes, we have, we have absolutely no way of escaping these elements. The future predictors don't suggest that we can avoid or escape them or ever be able to predict or forecast them. What the future predictors, the change analysts, and the trendsayers say in effect is that with the aid of institute resources, computers, linear programming, etc., they will deal with the kind of change that are changes that are not the consequences of the random event, the genius, the maniac, and the prophet. To which I can only say, <laughs> there really aren't any, not any worth looking at anyhow. So even from a secular point of view, I don't know if Nisbet was a Christian. It doesn't come across, he doesn't come across as one, although he seems to respect Christianity as, as an intellectual force. He's basically saying, we can't predict the future because there are random elements, which, you know, any good evolutionist should admit, reality is random. So we can't foretell the future, so give it up. Now, from a Christian point of view, we can look at history. Let's look at two, two days. Let's look at Good Friday. Wow, that was a sad day. These 12, 11 guys went into mourning and hiding, um, and it was all over, and they trusted it should have been him that redeemed Israel, and, 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 and it's just, you know, from there on out, they could draw the line straight to hell. God failed, the promise failed, it's all over. Now let's pick a third day, it's called Easter morning. Even Satan didn't see that one coming. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that day changed the history of the world. So we need to be very careful about when we say, oh, things are so dark and so black and so horrible. Let's, let's stop drawing lines. Let's just start believing the promises of God and not feel overwhelmed by the world around us. Yes. We, we, we have this relationship with God. He's got us. He's our shepherd. We shall not want. And let's just keep on keeping on with the stuff he's given us and be thankful for our families and our jobs and our food and our homes and for the freedom we have to worship him. Amen. I I also just want to add to it's it's an interesting thing that secularists think that they can predict the future in any extent because at least conceivably according to their according to their understanding of you know evolutionary biology today's men are not the same as yesterday's men. Right. So what reason do we have to suspect that they will continue to act the way that they have in the past. We don't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, Carl Truman wrote a book called The Creedal Imperative. Mm. And it's about the necessity, the importance of having your beliefs about God written down as a Christian mm -hmm. and kind of drawing from uh, Paul's uh, instruction to uh, remember the pattern of sound words right. that I have taught to you yes. and he says that the, the one of the reasons why modern man and white just generally man revolts against having a written set of beliefs a tradition you know the the catholics call it the magisterium but right. um you know, you know the, 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 what, what the protestants would consider tradition are things like the creeds and right. the confessions of the Re reformation era and he basically says the reason why people don't like these things is because they don't think people a thousand years ago are as developed as them, are as yeah. intelligent as them, understand the world as much as we do. So why should we listen to anything <laughs> they say? The world, human nature is something that for them is ever constant and ever in flux. So you can't even say things about humanity that are true from AD right. 1000 to 82,000. Yeah. That uh, men, men were primitive and we are, we are smarter than they were. <clears throat> about Despite that. our profound ignorance of everything. <laughs> one, reason, one reason you should all enroll in a history class right now, <clears throat> if nothing else, just to find out how the rest of men and the rest of time lived and thought and find out 
you know what? They were the image of God too. They were sinners too. And they may not have been as stupid as you think, just maybe a little more consistent to their unbelief at times. Yep. Well, in any case, I think that's a perfect place to wrap up. Um, I know what I would like to recommend. Go ahead. You have a recommendation. I do, as a matter of fact. You want go me ahead. to go first? Okay. I mentioned it in passing, and the more we talk, the more I thought, hmm, this, this, this will do. Some of you may know the science fiction writer Isaac Asimov. Others may say, science fiction, ew. All right, well, <laughs> he's not the greatest literary stylist in the world. I'll give you that easily. But in his original Foundation series, or trilogy, it was a trilogy back then, and now it's like encompasses every book he ever wrote. <laughs> um, but originally it was just, it was three books, Foundation, Second Foundation, Foundations. No, I'm forgetting one. There's a third one. I forget the exact order. The first one's called Foundation. It's said in the far distant future, Galactic uh, Empire has expanded to, well, build a galaxy. So it's, it's kind of a, a play on the idea of the Roman Empire. And uh, one man, uh, a psychomathematician, has, has turned psychology in, into a statistical science where if you deal with large enough populations, you can statistically predict the future. And what he has predicted is the fall of the empire. Well, the powers that be want to shut him up because that's not helpful to anybody. But what we find out eventually is that using this new science, he has actually engineered the future of the galaxy. If he can just push a couple buttons in the right places and trick a couple people into doing the right things at the right moment, then history will move toward a new empire. And in terms of this conversation and in terms also of the whole enlightenment ideal that if using mathematics and science, give us enough time, give us enough money, give us enough data, we can hand you an ideal future. We can predict it, we can manipulate it, and we can drop utopia in the laps of your grandchildren. Just give us a little time. This is as good a statement of how that idea can be simplified, simply explained as anything. And you can get teenagers who are interested in sci-fi to read it. Um, it's not super profound or super deep. It's played out in very plain language without a lot of color and metaphor. As I say, it's, he's not a great literary stylist. But reading the first book alone, I think, will be worth your time if you want a clear idea of, of this whole idea of predicting the future scientifically. Before the birth of science, we called it magic, called it divination. But now <laughs> science, science claims to be able to do it rationally by analyzing cause and effect. And this is kind well, it's so of so much the, different when you do numbers. Yes, numbers are everything. Oh, don't get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I've read. No, I'm, I'm going to stop right there. So that's my recommendation. <laughs> we'll talk about the Enlightenment, Rosicrucianism, and alchemy, and the Enlightenment, and things. some other time. All yours. Before I get to my recommendation, uh, related to that is is um, actually one of my favorite TV shows. It's probably in my top ten. It's definitely my top 10 is called person of interest mm -hmm. and yeah. it plays on that as well. Where basically, yes. I mean, th this is mildly spoilery by the end of the series, <laughs> you have one of the, the, the main, uh, she was a side character. She ends up becoming a main character. She is openly referring to these artificial intelligence systems that are able to watch everyone learn their behavior, predict their their quirks and everything. And I don't want to get too in the weeds on that. But basically, <laughs> um, functionally speaking, it can predict the future. And every week, it spits out a social security number yeah. for somebody that's in danger that week. And that's yeah. kind of the conceit of the show. But by the end, most of that has gone away because more meta plot considerations have uh, taken over. Um, and essentially... This side character, now main character, is openly referring to the rival AI systems as gods. Yes. Because what else do you call something that sees everyone and knows everything and can tell you the future? Yep. Yep. And speaking of um, knowing the future, the opposite of that is knowing the past. And that is what my recommendation is. Uh, there is a wonderful podcast. I've recommended... Um, the author who is one of the co-hosts for uh, Tom Holland, the historian, oh. not the Spider-Man. Right. <laughs> he, 
his podcast he hosts with another historian named Dominic Sandbrook, and it's called The Rest is History. Mm. They started it, it's either late 2019 or 2020, right before the pandemic hit. And neither man, neither host is a Christian. Yeah. But Tom Holland, uh, I've recommended his book called... I actually can't remember the name of it, but it's about Christianity, the history of Christianity, the history of the West, Western yeah, culture. Dominion? Dominion. Thank you. That was the yeah. title of it. I'm in the middle of it someplace right now. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Even though he's agnostic by his own declaration, he loves the history that Christianity has created. He basically said, oh, I recognize that like, I, I, I grew up and I loved Rome and I loved Greece and I read them when I was older and I thought, none of these people I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all the things that I value as a, as a modern Western man are directly descended from Christianity's influence on Europe. Yeah, but his podcast is really great because they talk about various things, and it's kind of funny because his his co host pokes fun at Tom about mm -hmm. he's like, oh yes, well, of course, in this section you're going to you're going to speak about Christianity again. He's like, well, yes, of course, I'm going to talk about Christianity because we're talking about <laughs> Europe in the Middle Ages. It's it, everything is about Christianity here, <laughs> and it's really really wonderful. Uh, there was actually two. I've been I've been binge listening to them because I I have like a two year uh, backlog to catch up on, <laughs> uh, but. The the first one that was really interesting was about um, the Aztec Empire, mm. and they had a host on, or a a guest on who talked about the, the the history of the Aztec Empire that she had studied um, for a book that she had written about them, and it was very interesting to hear these people talk about it. And it's like so so tell us more. Are we wrong about the Aztecs being horrible? And it's like well not entirely. Like, <laughs> The stereotypes are a bit extreme, but like they they were bad. Like let's not get it wrong. <laughs> it's like it was it was kind of interesting to hear them say it's like in their in their mindset, in their culture, in their religion, and all this. It's like they 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 like if you read poetry from the Aztecs, you actually see like sadness over the fact that death is a thing. Yeah, even as they were out there murdering people and like, well, but they were doing it to save the world and postpone the age of fire. There's actually <laughs> that may not have been what they believed. Is the oh, interesting really? Fact. Really? It's just that it's it's a way of um, essentially feeding the the gods yeah. because the gods eat up blood, you know. And it's like also if they also thought that like um, warriors who died in battle got to live past death spiritually in some sense in the form of a butterfly bringing nectar to the goddess of nature okay I want great to be hope for the afterlife <laughs> but even then it's like that's only four years like after that it's it's oblivion functionally yeah. um and you know all sorts of horrible details about what the what the priests did to themselves uh bodily it seems like every weird religion which is you know, all of them except Christianity, basically. <laughs> um, they they do weird things to male genitalia. It's just yeah, like a inevitably. Inevitably. It's it's interesting. There's probably something about the fifth point of covenant there. Uh yeah, oh, yeah. You know. Well, well uh, you and know. then the other one was about Nero, which I also uh -huh. found interesting because they said, you know, a lot of the writing we have is from people who didn't like him, including senators and, and all this. You know, no he was, one did. <laughs> he was bad and he was but, but like the other thing was, it said, um, in order to have lasted as long as he did, he had to have some skills. So he wasn't oh, yeah. a fop. No, he no, no. he could write horses very well, and apparently write poetry. And maybe a lot of the things that he did were pure pageantry. But he was also, you know, still a bit nuts. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, it was very interesting to hear. You know, we're we're very used, I think, uh, to hearing about Nero and about. Uh, Aztecs from from a Christian perspective, which is a good yeah. thing. We should be analyzing these things objectively and saying what they did was like wicked. So, <laughs> but it's also good, I think, to to hear other perspectives and and try to get a more cohesive idea and still obviously come out the other end saying, yeah, they still deserved everything they got. <laughs> as a as an interesting ending side note, uh, Tom Holland mentioned that there is a tradition in rabbinic Judaism that states that Nero actually faked his death, fled to Judea, and converted 
to Judaism and that there is a line of rabbis descended from him. Oh, wow. So that's a thing. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that'd make an interesting conspiracy story, I guess. Okay. I'm I suppose so. Mind. Maybe we can use it someday. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, I think that is the perfect place to draw this discussion to a close. If you would like to follow us, you can do so on YouTube, Rumble, on our Facebook page. And if you'd like to subscribe to us after listening to us, you can do so through literally any podcast catcher. You can reach us at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. If you would like to support us financially, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash haltingtowardzion. No spaces there. We also want to thank all of our financial supporters, the ones that, that do help keep the show running and our subscriptions to various softwares running. Uh, you help make the show happen. We're very thankful to you for that. And also a thanks to uh, David Maxson, our producer. Thank you very much for listening, and we hope you have a great time. Bye. Thank you.